So it's a pleasure to welcome Lorenzo a long way, all the way from the Amherst. Yeah, <laughs> with, a, with a long uh, stopover in Paris. Yeah, with a sabbatical in Paris and therefore uh, found the opportunity to come up here and teach us about magnetic fields. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I'm here mostly to get taught about magnetic fields. So, first of all, thank you very much for having me over. Um, it's a great pleasure. Uh, and really, if it weren't for the fact that I'm giving this talk here, I wouldn't be giving this talk. This is work in progress. Chances are that you know we find some mistakes somewhere and it's all around. But for the time being, uh, you know the part of the challenges I think is well established, and is, I'm mostly going to give a review of known stuff. The possible way out is based on work in preparation with Chiara Caprini. Hopefully, it will be out soon, unless we soon discover that it doesn't work at all. Um, and again, I'm choosing to give the talk in this place because I think here people, you guys can teach me something about this stuff actually. Well, <laughs> so let me start with a one uh, slide of motivation that I want to be uh, very minimal and I don't want to go farther than that about observations. There are magnetic fields out there, I think people agree on that. There are magnetic fields at measure, you know, in the ga galaxy scales. They have been measured, you know, in great detail or in reasonably good detail by now. And, uh, you know, in the, in the micro gauss range. What is uh, more interesting, there are measurements also at the cluster scale that are a little bit less, uh, less uh, well established. What has been especially interesting has been observation from blazers of a possible lower bound of the magnetic fields with coherence lengths that are cosmological, of the order of the megaparsec. Okay? I will not go into the detail of this measurement. I will just take it at face value. I will assume that there are magnetic fields of the order of 10 to minus 17, 10 to minus 18, 10 to minus 16 gauss measured with a coherence length of 1 megaparsec. And there is one slide stolen from this recent review by Duran and Aronoff where they have Actually, that's the important information that is here. <laughs> Strength of the magnetic field in Gauss, in lo well, log 10 of Gauss, and coherence length, megaparsec. And what they have is this sort of lower bound here, even if here this line should be much more fuzzy. You know, at the megaparsec scale, again, at delta minus 17 G, uh, Gauss. And this would be the main motivation of this talk. There are magnetic fields that are produced at cosmological scales, at scales where we typically do not expect any astrophysics to have any possible effect. So there's some reasonable, you know, uh, doubt that these guys could be of primordial origin. They would come from something that happened before, you know, before a combination, before the universe became transparent to light, before structure formation. So why not to consider models of inflation? You know, inflation is a period of very fast expansion of the universe in very, very, very early times, where scales get stretched very quickly. And as a consequence, I, you know, it's reasonable to expect that a nice way of creating anything that has a long coherence length <laughs> can be generated by inflation. And this is the main advantage of considering magnetogenesis during inflation. The main disadvantage, as people know in this room very well, is that first of all, you cannot just take, you know, standard model electromagnetic Lagrangian, put it on an expanding space, and expect that the expanding space is able to generate a large magnetic field because it turns out that this Lagrangian actually is invariant conformally. This means if I am in an expanding universe, I can write a metric this way, and this is what I, the metric I will use throughout my talk. I can go in the Coulomb gauge, perfectly fine, this is free electromagnetism. In which case, my Lagrangian becomes just of this form, and this is just the Lagrangian of a free field of Minkowski space. So, if I quantize it, it stays there as any free field in Minkowski space. It doesn't feel the expansion of the universe, it doesn't feel anything else. So, if I want to generate these large magnetic fields during inflation, I have to go beyond this. Okay? And there are two ways of going beyond this that has been studied in the past. One in greater detail, one in slightly less detail, and I will spend some time now reviewing both of them, virtual advices, um, because this will be important for what I'm going to discuss next. 
So the two ways are based on uh, possibly multiplying the two scalar invariants I can write with f mu nu by functions of time. And since during inflation, time is basically the clock during inflation is given by the inflaton, the typical assumption is that I have an inflaton, I have some function of the inflaton that is multiplied the Lagrangian f mu nu f mu nu. If the inflaton is evolving with time, now I have a time-dependent constant in front of this, okay? In other words, I have a time-dependent renormalization of the wave function of the photon, and I can hope, by studying this time-dependent renormalization, that quanta of photon are amplified, okay? Um, this was first discussed by Rattler in 1992. Um, that's the first option. Second option, play with the other, with the other scalar, actually pseudo-scalar I can build with the electromagnetic field. And this was first suggested by Turner and Wheelow, and then studied in more detail by Carroll, Phil, and Garrison. And the idea is now, take a pseudo-scalar inflaton, I can build a pseudo-scalar with the electromagnetic field, F mu nu, F mu tilde. By dimensional analysis, this operator is to be divided by some constant with the dimension of a mass that I call F throughout. Um, for those that are familiar with pseudo-scalar inflatons, sometimes they come out in a, a potential that is of the form cosine of phi over f. That f that appears in the cosine, for my purposes, has nothing to do with this f. Okay? I will assume that this phi field is rolling, doing its own thing for some reason. It's potentially coming from God knows where. And this is just a coupling. Okay? If the pseudo-scalar is pseudo-scalar, I expect to have this coupling. Actually, you know, according to the standard law that, you know, everything that is not forbidden is compulsory in quantum field theory, if the, pseudo the inflaton is a pseudo-scalar, then this coupling must exist because there is no charges that forbid it. Question? Just a very stupid question, I think. So, in, in the... the upper uh, case there, you have some function of the field phi, right? Yeah. Which has a, a mass dimension. Yeah. So then you would expect that you need another mass uh, scale yes. to, to sort, sort of cancel it. And, and yeah. what, which one do you use for, for that? Whatever I like. Ah, okay. Uh, <laughs> but that's, a, that's not a stupid question at all. You know, that, uh, as I will discuss, if you... Uh, I will be, and people have been, maximally relaxed in the construction of the, these models with respect to all that concerns, you know, consistency of loop effects. Things turn out to be already difficult enough, even if you give up all this. So we put, you know, typical assumption is that, uh, you know, this is typically e to the phi over Planck mass times a number of order unity. That makes sense, okay? Uh, maybe it's a number larger than order unity, maybe order 10, but it's if I want really to put this in a fully fledged theory, things can be complicated, but I would not want to put it in a full fledged theory. Okay? Um, so, this is the Ratra model, this is the Axiom model. So, now we'll discuss Ratra model, was studied in detail by many people, including people here. Um, Axiom model, less detail. I will discuss them both now. Um, of course, by the way, I forgot, you know, feel free to interact with your questions. There's no stupid questions, there are, there are stupid answers that I can give, but all questions are always very well. Um, so let me re review very quickly this rata magnetogenesis. So I have this function f of phi. As I said, I do the same decomposition as before. You know, this gauge invariant, uh, there's nothing, nothing different happening. By the way, there are other possibilities, that, you know, that involve, you know, giving a mass to the photon or more complicated things. I will not discuss those here. I will try to pick, uh, stick only to the simplest gauge invariant version of the story. Uh, f of phi, phi is a function of conformal time tau, so f is f of tau, and I will model this as a simple f of tau that is of this form. Okay, so the scale factor is minus h tau to the minus one. So this is minus h tau to the minus n. So it's the scale factor to the n, and I'm assuming that this function is normalized in such a way that it's equal to 1 at the end of inflation. I can always renormalize the wave function of the photon so that at the end of inflation this number is 1. Okay? Um, 
So one first condition turns out that, you know, for f different from 1, the charge of the electron is proportional to f to the minus 1. If I renormalize this, usually this is 1 over 4 e squared, where e is the charge of the electron. So if I want to avoid strong coupling, f better be always much larger than 1, or at most equal to 1. This implies that n has to be negative. Okay, this will be the first constraint on the model, and then we'll stick to this complex strain. Um, okay, small assumptions there. Then I can write a canonically normalized field that I quantize. It satisfies this nice equation that is very simple, and in particular that it leaves at large late times tau small. This term dominates, and this leads to an amplification of the of the mode functions of the tilde field. Okay, because there is a minus sign here. And then one solves all the equations with the appropriate condition, and one discovers that at the end of inflation, the magnetic field at the scale L roughly scales as the Hubble parameter squared that gives the overall mass dimension. It has a coherence length of the order of the Hubble length at the end of inflation, and it has a spectral index n plus 3. So depending on that index n that I add here, that's important, I can get any, any spectral index I like. In particular, if I take n equal to minus 3, this is scale invariant. That's the best thing. I have equal power at all scales. And then, then if I put, you know, h of the order of like 10 to 12 GV, I get 10 to minus 12 Gauss. Remember that I need 10 to minus 17. So this is great. However, it turns out that if I compute the electric field at the same time, this has the same scaling but with n plus 2. It's one more power of length. So this gives an infrared divergence for n equal to minus 3, that is the case where I was happy here. So in particular, the energy in the electric field piles up at large scales, so that if I require to have 60 folds of inflation and I have all these infrared modes in the electric field that are piling up, they contribute a lot of energy, and then my, they would back react on my inflating background, and I don't trust my theory anymore, and I have a problem. You know, that, it just means that my consistency of my treatment is, is not valid. I can evade, uh, evade the back reaction by assuming that n is larger than minus 2. But then if I take this result at phase value, I get 10 to minus 32 Gauss at 1 megaparsec if I insist on h equal to 10 to 12, 10 to 13, 10 to 14 GB. Okay? So things are bad. There are ways out. and. Uh, you know, Martin and collaborators have discussed this, I think, in the nicest possible way. And, you know, correct me if I'm quoting you in the wrong way. But you can get ways out, but it's difficult, you know. First of all, well, the best thing you can do is to assume, since you have a problem from infrared divergences, you want this thing to last for the shortest possible amount of time. Because otherwise, if you leave more time, the electric field will build up. Shortest amount of time, we need at least one megaparsec scale. So this is one condition. And then you choose the spectral index n to be the nicest one for me. And you require that inflation happens at low scale. And this actually makes things better because, basically because the energy density in the electric field goes, scale says h to the 4. The energy density in the background scale says h squared. So by lowering h, that is lowering the energy scale during inflation, you have more room to put your magnetic field. And you can get these values. However, you have to do it at the price, at this price. And if and only if you want to take bicep 2 seriously, and I will do it here in this talk for the sake of doing it, uh, this is even worse because if you take just bicep 2 at my face value, Bicep 2 tells you that we observe gravitational waves that are typically produced as amplification of vacuum fluctuations during inflation. And the amplitude of these gravitational waves in the standard mechanism of generation of gravitational waves during inflation is tied to the energy density during inflation. So it's a direct measurement of the Hubble parameter during inflation. It tells you that the energy density during inflation is 10 to 16 GV instead of 10 to 10 MeV. So you have a problem there, and this was also pointed out here. And again, I'm, I'm happy to correct if I'm misrepresenting by any means your, your results. Okay, 
So this is about retromagnetogenesis, and the bottom line is, you know, it's possible, but it's difficult. Axiom magnetogenesis. So, why, why this is different? Well, as you certainly know, if phi is a constant, this term here is a total derivative. It's possible to prove that this term in the Lagrangian, therefore, if phi is a constant, this term doesn't contribute to the equation of motion because of this tilde. This also means that if I do an integration by part, there is an epsilon here, okay? I can do an integration by part, and since phi depends mostly on time, I will assume that the only part that the, so I take one of the derivatives here, I have d mu a nu, d mu a nu. I take one of d mu's, it I can add here, but it gives zero because now it's contracted on an epsilon and the, the, there is a symmetric derivative d mu, d mu, with an epsilon mu, mu, etc. So they cancel out. Or they can act on phi. So the only part that survives is the d mu acting on phi. Phi is mostly time dependent, so it becomes a phi dot. Epsilon i, j, k, a, i, d, j, a, k. Okay. Why this is interesting? Because, well, if I go in, uh, in momentum space, this is phi dot over x, epsilon i, j, k, a, i, k, j, a, k. And this changes sign, it's odd, under this change of time. Sign. So this means that this term doesn't have a definite sign in the Lagrangian. So this is a non-positive definite term also in my Hamiltonian when I go through my Legendre transform. So this means that my Hamiltonian is virtually unbounded from below. It's not really, because how can it be unbounded from below, in particular if k gets really large. But if k gets really large, then you have a k-square term here that is compensated. <laughs> Still, the Hamiltonian, the total Hamiltonian for the system goes negative. So this signals some potential instability. And I will show this in a second again. Notice that instability happens only for one side of k and not for the other side of k. Okay? And I will discuss this more explicitly in equations in a second. So it's convenient, thank you, it's convenient to decompose the photon in elicity mode. So I have this E tensors, well, vectors in this case, that depend on helicity and depend on momentum. And I have this A lambda, vector modes that are, I have lambda equal to plus one or minus one, and this determines the helicity of the photons I'm looking at. Okay? Can I have right-handed or left-handed photons? When I write down the equation of motion for the mode functions, what I get? I get something that is consistent, hopefully, with what I told you before. First of all, if phi dot or phi prime, prime is derivative with respect to conformal time. If phi dot of phi prime is zero, this is zero. I get standard electromagnetism. I just get a standard field, and nothing happens to it. This is the usual story that standard electromagnetic field on a conformal universe doesn't do anything. A second plus k square a equal to zero. Vacuum solution. This term here is proportional to one power of momentum. Here it is. It's proportional to lambda. Lambda is the sine of helicity. So depending on the sine of phi prime over f, one of the two helicity modes will have a negative contribution here proportional to k. So that for k sufficiently small, this term dominates over this one, and I have an instability. Okay. I have a second equal to plus something positive a. So the solution to this equation is exponential. Uh, since here there is a prime, there is even some powers of the scale factor, it turns out that actually this instability is not a terrible instability. Basically, it's important only for a short amount of time, and then eventually, when I go to small, to, you know, modes get expanded, this means k becomes smaller and smaller, so the instability is still there, but it's decreasing so quickly. The rate of instability is decreasing so quickly that eventually it goes to zero. So you have a peak of instability for momenta that are intermediate, that are of the order, as you will see, of Hubble parameter, basically. Um, once it down solves these equations exactly, and one discovers that actually there is an exponential application only of left-handed modes, not of the right-handed modes, because I started, remember, I started with a pseudo-scalar inflaton, this is a giving a parity violating background to me. And now this parity violation is propagated to the photons 
in such a way that only left-handed modes and not right-handed modes, for instance, or the other way around, depending on the size of this quantity, are amplified by this exponential amount, phi dot over fh. Okay? This will be the main quantity we'll deal with also for the rest of the talk. Okay? And again, the parity violation is also implicit in this k goes to minus k part, in which I was saying that for one sign of k, your Hamiltonian is positive, but for the other sign of k, it can get negative. Okay? Then you sit down and you compute, and eventually you get a magnetic spectrum that has this form. H squared, as before, out of dimensional analysis, same as Ratra. E to the pi psi, where psi is this quantity here. So this is different now. This quantity can be larger than 1. So in principle, the overall normalization can be larger. But, this is, then I'm done with tunable parameters. And it turns out that, in particular, the spectral index is fixed to B2. While in the Ratra model, the spectral index was 3. Okay? The spectrum is very blue. And then the, this analysis was roughly done in these terms by Carroll, Field, and Garretson more than 20 years ago. And they concluded that because of the blue spectrum, you know, what can be, how large can this be? Well, at most, this has to be so large that the energy density in the magnetic field is comparable to the energy density in the background. It cannot be larger than that because otherwise I would have a back reaction problem, you know. I have a background that is producing a magnetic field and then the energy of the magnetic field is larger than the energy of the background. That doesn't make any sense. Okay. So you impose a, a very, you know, the, the most conservative requirement is that, you know, h4 e to the 2 pi psi is smaller than h square mp square. They still assume that h was 10 to 14 GV. They didn't consider a possibility of lowering the scale of inflation. Then they look at the magnetic field and they say, oh, wait, there is this big suppression here. And that's how that the magnetic field you get at, you know, at megaparticle scale is like 10 to minus 40 Gauss and forget about it. Okay? So things are not good even in this case. However, what we discovered, uh, well, with my student back then, Mohamed Amber, and this was many years ago, 2006, what actually Mohamed discovered was that in the meanwhile there had been some development in the literature concerning the evolution of <coughs> magnetic fields in the cosmic plasma. So what he discovered, well, what people knew actually, was the following thing. First of all, if there is one quantity that characterizes the magnetic field, it is called helicity. It is defined in this way, and it is, you know, basically the number of right-handed photons minus the number of left-handed photons per unit time, per unit volume. Okay? And this is, this quantity is, a max, cannot be larger than some quantity that depends on the energy density of the magnetic field. Okay? It turns out that since the background that produced my magnetic field is parity violating, and since I was saying, and, and there's a consequence as I was saying, you produce only left-handed photons and no right-handed photons, this field has maximal helicity. You know, helicity can range only within a finite range. This is the maximal possible value. In, in the regime of large conductivities, you have this equation that tells you that helicity is basically conserved for large conductive media. Turns out that the universe, after reheating, is, has a very large conductivity, and for all practical purposes, helicity is conserved. Okay. At the same time, we know that there are dissipative processes that operate at small scales. Typically, all these magnetic fields have some scale dependence where they are very, very strong at some coherence length, and then they have some power low decay at larger scales. Where they are very strong, these magnetic fields dissipate their energy in the motion of plasma, and so their power goes down at small scales. I will have a plot describing this in a second. But if the power went just down, helicity wouldn't be conserved. So in order to conserve helicity, the power has to go down at the coherence length, but then it has to go somewhere else. And this leads to what is known as a process of inverse cascade that was studied, among others, by these guys. Okay? So to have a pictorial description of this, this is from a paper by Danzig and Manergy, 2004, 10 years ago. This is numerical simulations. This is not in an expanding universe. They are putting a magnetic field in a box with a plasma. And 
they are starting with the solid line. This is the initial spectrum. They have energy in the magnetic field as a form, function of momenta. So this is small scales, this is large scales. This is for zero helicity, <coughs> this is for maximal helicity. So as you see, for zero helicity, as I was saying before, you know, where you have maximal magnetic field, there is plasma motions that dissipate the energy in the magnetic field, and it gets redistributed in such a way that you get more energy at these smaller scales. But at largest scales, basically nothing happens. Okay. On the other hand, in the case of maximal helicity, and again, this is the results from numerical simulation that by now are sort of understood. At small scales, you have exactly the same behavior as here. But then, in order to conserve helicity, the power has to go somewhere. And there are two interesting phenomena. The first one is not really surprising. The peak moves out. The second thing that is more surprising, but by now apparently is well understood, is that this property of cell similarity, the spectral index stays constant. So you're really, you know, by dissipating energy at this scale, so you're really increasing magnetic fields at this scale. Okay. Um, and, you know, you can find a sort of very simple, naive uh, scaling argument from the mathematical point of view to find these scalings, and then you can check with numerics, and to the extent that you trust the numerics, everything seems to be working fine. And what you find is basically the coherence length increases with time. This is inconformal. So this is always in this fixed box, it's, it's neglecting the expansion of the universe. But given that you are in a radiation, radiation dominated universe, with magnetic fields that are, you know, there are simple conformal properties of this, then going to an expanding universe is going to get quickly done. Yes. Um, there's, no, there's no horizons in the uh, uh -huh. situation, is there? No. And uh, once you do things right, one first thing you want to do is to make sure that these things are treated within the horizon. And what we do is just, well, what we did is just to assume that as long as you are outside of the horizon, nothing happens. So still, energy, still, uh, yeah, energy, uh, the energy is pushed to the horizon still, right? No yeah, else. yeah. So there's one extra thing, however, that is that is not clear from here, is that they start this this model. You see, typically there is a time scale for which this thing starts happening. They choose the initial conditions in such a way that this time scale is automatically zero. So they choose the coherence length. The time scale depends on the magnetic field and on the coherence length. They choose the coherence length in such a way that the, the time scale where this decay starts is, is immediate. Otherwise, you have to take, to take into account that time that you need to get to this condition, but you, know, you get there. And eventually, this thing starts again. Um, and if you read this paper carefully, they talk about the apparently IA causal behavior here. But they claim that it is actually perfectly causal. I mean, it's, it's, it's not forbidden by, by you know, speed of light equal to one. Uh, it, it's just that usual, uh, um, it's just that it happens on time scales that are, you know, things here are happening on time scales that are determined by physics here. That's the sort of IA causal behavior. But it's not forbidden by any, by any uh, fundamental physics condition. So the coherence length increases, the magnetic field strength goes down, and there is this self-similarity property that I mentioned. Okay? And that's, as far as I know, it's a fact of life that you have to take more or less seriously. And I, I would say by, then, by now there is consensus that is, this is well known. So in practice, the story is more complicated because this behavior I've shown is valid only in regime of a turbulent and turbulent regime, so large Reynolds number. But they show that actually you have a sufficient number of turbulent regimes in the history of the expansion of the universe by which the behavior I just discussed on average holds. So this is the commoving magnetic field as a function of temperature. Now this is for, the, for, the, for an expanding universe. So now temperature is actually decreasing, OK? Or if you want, this is time. Same here. This is the, coherence, sorry, this is the intensity of the field. This is the coherence length. And you see you have different phases. So the top line here, this is the horizon, by the way. The top line here is the coherence length for a maximally helical field. 
This is a coherence length for a field with zero helicity to start with. Same here, this is the magnetic field for a maximally helical, this is for zero helicity. And while you know this behavior looks funny and complicated, they can actually account for it, and you know it would take a full talk to discuss it. But the main thing I care about is that on average we have this behavior, conformal time to the two thirds for the expansion, and conformal time to the minus third for the intensity of the magnetic field. This is the energy, so it's minus two thirds. It is the square. From where to where? Well, basically from the time where turbulent behavior starts, that's basically right after the modes get inside the horizon, all the way to the combination, 0.3 electron volts in temperature. Okay? And this is the final result. It is simple, relatively simple. And this takes into account also this thing I was mentioning of not assuming that the initial coherence length is determined by the turbulence. So you get the coherence length is given by the initial one times... This factor that would have been there no matter what is just usual stretching of uh, you know lines in an expanding universe times this factor here that goes as well these coefficients never mind they are not that important rate in temperature over a combination to the two thirds and this gives you you know a nice boost of you know if rate in temperature is ten to nine GB this gives you a nice boost uh, of 10 to 9 over 10 to 9 is 10 to 18 to the 2 thirds, 10 to 12 in coherence length. The magnetic field decreases, and by the way, the helicity is proportional to B squared times L, and you easily see that B squared times L have these two factors canceling out. This is how actually you compute these two factors, by imposing that B squared times L stays constant in commuting units. Okay? And what we concluded with Mohammed was that, in particular, if I, well, I, back then we didn't use this 10 to 17, minus 17 Gauss, because people weren't caring about that number back then. But, you know, I took that paper back now, and, you know, I can get 10 to minus 17 Gauss at 1 megaparsec, assuming this parameter psi to be equal to 16, whatever. You know, it's a number that appears in an exponential, so... Uh, small changes in this lead to big changes in my result. Or what is more interesting, the energy scale of inflation is about 10 to 10 GV. That's pretty nice. However, well, there is an however that I will discuss in a second, but before, let me use exactly the same tag I used for the Ratra model. I still have a serious problem with bicep, because bicep is telling you that inflation should... At least, if you take bicep at face value, you first assume that it's true, and second, you assume that this determines the energy scale of inflation by the standard production of gravitational waves during inflation, that I will discuss in more detail in a second. And I use it to imply that the energy scale of inflation is 10 to 16 GV, and I have a problem of six orders of magnitude. That's pretty bad, actually. So things are already not that great for this, and then, in 2010, Barnaby and Peloso, oh, there should be a tilde here, sorry. Barnaby and Peloso studied the way this coupling of the inflaton to FF tilde affects other observables in the CMB. And what they observed was that, um, let me go here, sorry. You know, you have phi over f, f mu nu, f mu nu tilde. When you write equations of motion for the perturbations of the inflaton, the perturbations of the inflaton, now, you know, are delta phi second plus 3h delta, uh, well, delta phi double dot, plus 3h delta phi dot, plus h squared delta phi, equal to this source. 1 over f, f mu nu, f mu nu tilde. So that the inflaton perturbations take a contribution from this source, okay? And in particular, this contribution is quadratic in this source. Now, uh, you know, fields whose amplitude is amplified by some background evolution mechanism, such as this guy, have a Gaussian statistics. The square of the field, of a Gaussian field, is not a Gaussian field. 
So this means that now the inflaton perturbations take a contribution that is proportional to some non-Gaussian source. And as a consequence, they become non-Gaussian themselves. And we know that in the CMB there are very strong constraints on non-Gaussianities that are related to the fact that there are inflaton perturbations that should be very Gaussian. So they used, uh, they used this analysis to compute the FNL, that is the measure that measures, the quantity that measures non-Gaussianities in the CMB. They found it that it has the so-called equilateral shape for those that care about those details. Um, and this is the number they got. <laughs> and it's proportional to this quantity here, that is actually something you cannot play with because this is fixed by the amplitude of perturbations in, in inflation. So this is a fixed number and only a function of psi. Once you impose once, thank you. Once you impose the, the Planck constraints, that is F and L equilateral smaller than about 150 and 2 sigma, this gives you psi smaller than 2.2. Remember, I needed psi equal to 16 to get my magnetic fields. So this totally rules out this model. Okay. Okay. So this is the review part. On this part, I'm reasonable confident that you know, barring possible things that I forgot to mention, this is all I said is basically true. Uh, questions here? No. And it's one hour, right? Total, so uh, until 3:15 or so. I think I will be doing even better than that. So possible way out. So there's a number of problems I. I mentioned. First of all, I said that the RATRA model has the advantage that I can control the spectral index, but I cannot control the total amplitude, while the axiom model allows me to control the spectral, the amplitude, but doesn't control the spectral index. So, since I like to have the best of the two possible words on my, on my slide, I will consider a model that has both both things going on. Okay, I will use a hybrid of these two models that I will discuss in a second. Okay, it will be Ratra and Helical. Well, the, the, the temporary title on the on the draft is Helical Ratra Magnetogenesis. Next, there is an excessive FNL. Well, this FNL is related to the fact that I'm insisting in coupling the inflaton to FF tilde, or there could be something similar if I were to couple the inflaton to FF also, as also this was studied by Martin and collaborators. Uh, so that I have this equation in which I have the FF tilde directly sourcing the inflaton perturbation. The inflaton perturbation then that converted into metric perturbation because the inflaton is the dominant source of energy density in the universe. Simple way out that was actually proposed and not put in reference here, and I apologize, uh, was proposed uh, in a paper by Gary Shu, um, Neil Barnaby, Marco Peloso, and a bunch of other people. <laughs> Let's assume this guy is not an inflaton. Let's assume there is another field that is happening to be rolling during inflation, and this other field is doing nothing else but rolling during inflation and sourcing this, sourcing this guy. I don't want this guy to dominate the energy of the universe at any time. I don't want this guy to dominate the perturbations at any time. I just want it to be rolling at some constant pace. It can even be rolling slowly, because in any case, what I care about is phi dot over f. So if phi dot is really small, who cares? I can get an f that is always small enough so that this quantity stays finite. Um, and in this case, this is not true anymore. It will still be true through loops of gravitons, but at this point I will pay an extra suppression of Planck's here. Okay. So this is how I hope uh, and I expect to get out of this FNL problem. And then, Low scale inflation would not match bicep 2. This was the last problem. You know, it looks like in any case you, you have to lower it. It will be true also in our case. You have to lower the scale of inflation. Well, the solution in this case is to assume that uh, gravitational waves are not produced through the standard mechanism that is amplification of the vacuum fluctuations. I mean, there is a contribution there. 
but it's subdominant with respect to the fact that there are, you have all these photons around during inflation that are going to also produce gravitational waves. And you're using the gravitational waves of these photons to explain bicep, if you want to explain bicep. If bicep turns out to be wrong, well, in this case, you will have an upper bound. Instead of explaining this observation, we'll have just an upper bound. You don't want the gravitational waves produced by these photons, in any case, to, uh, you know, to be too large with respect to whatever bound is set by observation that can be bicep, Planck, or whatever else. So, the Lagrangian I'm going to discuss is this one, and I will try to motivate it even before the end of the talk. But I will take a completely phenomenological approach. Again, uh, the situation is sufficiently complicated that I am perfectly happy with taking this as a starting point, and then one day we will try to justify it. So as before, I have an f of tau. This is Ratra. And I have this constant gamma. That turns out to be a constant of order 10, and I will define this parameter psi to be equal to minus n gamma, where n is the index n appearing here. Okay. So this psi, in this case, will match exactly the psi I had in the previous slides. Then I can write the equations of motion that are just a hybrid of the two. Before, I was getting, you know, Rata would give me only this part. Axiom would give me only this part, where sigma now is sorry for changing the notation. Sigma is now the elicity of my field. And it's proportional just to one power of k. This is the one. One power of tau, because this was proportional to phi prime, but I'm assuming phi dot equal to torsten, so phi prime goes as one over tau. And I have this nice equation of motion that has the nice property that it's actually, a fun, the solution is going to be only a function of k tau. Um, so, yes, please. So gamma here is just a parameter? Yes. I'm assuming, it's a, I, I will try to justify it at the end, you know, don't take even too seriously what I'm going to say about justifying it. For the time being, it's just a parameter constant. Constant here, but it's multiplying a function of time overall. Yeah. So the, but now, so the Lagrangian now is explicitly parity violating, I suppose. Yes. Know, yes. Uh, wait, wait until the last slide, and then ask again the question, if you want, if, if it, that's okay with you. Uh, but basically, what I'm assuming is that I'm spontaneously violating parity by putting, a, you know, a parity violating, you know, I give in a verb to, an, uh, to another pseudo scalar. Yeah, sure. I guess we can just do yeah. More questions? Sure. Oh, no. Sorry. But then, in terms of where these couplings are coming from, right? You, all you have to assume is that there are some, you could just assume there are some heavy electro, electrically charged. Fermions, for example, around, right? You will get these, they're coupled to the input on, and then by loops you do get these. Yeah, I mean, in principle, I, I, I would be able to get that one too. I, I just want to be able to, to play with that F parameter, but yeah. I don't think you, but you cannot stopping. control the time dependence of that. Sorry? Right? You won't get a, you know, you cannot control the time dependence of that thing. All, all I'm saying is that, I mean, these, these couplings of the input on to F, or even to F, F I mean, they're not so. Uh, I mean, they're not so hard to get in an underlying normalizable model, are they? I mean, they, no, it's, no. it's similar to the Higgs Higgs type photon coupling. Right, the, but you need yeah. a you need a specific time dependent, right? So yeah, yeah. But uh, I think I think. Ah, uh, yeah. uh, sorry, maybe I'm fully understood. So that time dependence. So my original Lagrangian is this: <coughs> f of phi. Yeah, so phi of phi, phi. Minus one quarter. Well, uh, why don't I? No, I, I don't want. Uh, can I get an eraser? It's right behind your computer. Behind, behind your screen. It's behind. Behind the screen. Oh, behind the computer. 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 oh, oh, yeah. And it's even you know large enough that I'm supposed to say. Um, you know, eventually, I am already giving away my last slide, but that's not important. If you take some Sugra Lagrangian, you have something where your Lagrangian is minus one quarter real of some function f, 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 plus actually minus one quarter imaginary of some function f, f, f tilde, where this function f is a holomorphic function of superfields. Yeah. So what I assume is that it's x, y, where x and y are two fields, and you know, I get like real of x equal to zero, uh, sorry, 
imaginary of x equal to 0, real of y equal to some y naught, imaginary of y equal to gamma times y naught, and real of x that is independent. And this becomes real of x times y naught that multiplies 1 quarter by ff minus gamma over 4 ff of gamma. Okay, but the time dependence of x is not just coming from the evolution of the nucleoton or whatever. Yeah, then, then, then would, there would be some v of x yeah. that is determining the fact that x is wrong. Yeah. I'm not sure. Uh, am I? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm just trying to understand. Yes. So I mean, that's the setup. Then I'm pretty sure you can always all, also get something by integrating out stuff. But as Martin says, then I. Let's say I have more freedom if I do this. In terms of controlling time dependence, com making sure that this coefficient and this coefficient are scaling with the same way, for instance. Yeah. You see, eventually I have the, a single function of time. If not, things, I, I can do even with two functions of time. Just things get more complicated, and then I introduce artificially one scale that is the scale at which the two functions of time cross. My impression is you will get too weak at time dependence if you just integrate stuff. Right? Yeah. Unless you integrate a lot of stuff. Yeah, and usually you pay, you know, e, e cube uh, over, you know, 128 pi square factors that are killing you. But then you can choose the scale of the, the mass scale of what you're integrating out to compensate for that. Yeah. yeah. As long as it is, as long as I trust my perturbation theory, yes, I'm sure. I think the corrections normally come as log of A, log of the scale factor, and not as a power law. So, I, I mean, it's. Unless, at least for at first... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, you, yeah, yeah, you yeah. cannot get the power law from... Well, usually this is actually e to the something. Yes. I want this to be e to the field. Yeah, yeah okay. And the best way I can do this is actually... This is not e to the field, but then the field... This field is not canonically normalized. So I have the kinetic term that is dx squared over x squared. In which case, the canonically normalized field is log of x, and this x becomes e to the something. And then, even if it is log dependent on time, this gives a power law. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. So, this term here is giving my elliptic dependent component. This term here, so this dominates at intermediate scales. You see, remember, tau goes from minus infinity to zero as time goes on. So it's really, really every time this vacuum part contributes so that I can set up my bunch Davis vacuum. Then this part dominates. This part is parity, parity violating. I get an exponential amplification of one elicity mode and nothing of the other mode, actually an exponential suppression of the other mode. <coughs> so one of the two modes, so at this point I got exponential amplification and uh, parity violation. And then, even later on, this term dominates, and this term changes the spectral behavior at really large scales. So that the final spectral index is given by n. And then I can solve this equation exactly, and the equation is a combination of Coulomb wave functions. Uh, so of, you know, in some sense, the, the helical path is the initial conditions for the, for the Rattra phase. Exactly, okay. exactly. So you're basically producing some excited initial state, which is really cool. For Absolutely. Time. That's precisely what's going on. I have really two phases. One that happens at horizon crossing, where horizon yeah, is not H is H over Xi. Well, but but they, as you said, you cannot produce too much because then you get no Gaussianity. So it's really just producing a helical initial condition for amplifying with the Rattler guy basically afterwards, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. Well, you know, this non gaussianity I solved the problem by assuming that phi is not the inflaton. Otherwise, I would still have the same problem that I had. Yeah? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. So, this is the exact solution, and, you know, I don't know how good you are at visualizing Coulomb wave function. I'm not very good. So there are approximate expressions 
uh, intermediate scales, this is where the, the, the axial part is dominating. At the large scales, this is the part we really care about. This is an approximate behavior, and I really want you to care about you know, all these gamma, so then psi to the n, I don't really care. There are two things you want to look at. An exponential amplification of left-handed uh, photons only. Oh God, I'm going so slowly now. And an arbitrary spectral index. Okay? This is what I wanted to have from the first poem. So I'm getting it. Happy. Okay, constraints on parameter space. As before, I need to have n smaller than zero, otherwise I have strong coupling, or you know, a charge of the electron becomes 10 to 100, and I don't want to have. I also need to have n larger than minus 2, because otherwise I have this electric field that is infrared divergent, and then I have a problem with it. Turns out that n equal to minus 1, these equations are invariant under n goes to minus 1 half minus n. And in particular, n equal to 0 is equivalent to n to the minus 1. And so, in particular, n equal to minus 1 reproduces the same case as n equal to 0, that is, the axiom model that I discussed before. For this reason, I will only focus on this in a relatively narrow region, minus 2, smaller than n, smaller than minus 1. Okay. And I want to reobtain my older results with n equal to minus 1 um, that I got in the axiom model. So where does the main constraint come from? Instead of, you know, back then when we looked at the stuff, we were just imposing that the total energy was smaller than the background energy. This is a too loose a constraint. If you want to look at the real constraints, it turns out that the main constraint, if this guy here is not the inflaton, if this guy here is the inflaton, I go back to the Barnaby Peloso problem of two large non-Gaussianities and I'm still ruled out. If this guy here is not the inflaton, turns out, and I will try to argue about it, uh, that the main constraint comes from the overproduction of gravitational waves induced by the quantum magnetic fields during inflation. I will discuss this in a second. Questions? But you want to produce the gravitational uh, Either I want them, yes, or I don't want them to be too large. But yeah, this is the main phenomenological constraint. In this case, I want to produce them. Mm -hmm. I, well, I will need to. Let's say, for the time being, all I know is that I don't want to exceed that bound. But, uh, yeah. Even in the axial magnetogenesis, there, there was a constraint from back reaction on... Uh, Turns out that it's much looser than this one. This one, this one is much more stringent, by about 10 orders of magnitude. This was actually surprising for me, because I expected it to be 5 orders of magnitude, and then it's done. But that's, so the, that's yeah. why it's still work in progress, by the way, I'm not understanding that. But that case, in that case, I think the constraint was like uh, chi equal to less than 10 or less than 5, something like that. No, that was from non no, 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 I mean, it's just from, from the back reaction constraint. Oh, from the back reaction, it depends on the scale of inflation. So if the scale of inflation is 10 to 16 GV, but I mean then... The constraint on the parameter, because the parameter is... Yeah, yeah. The parameter, the, so the, the constraint on size depends on H. Oh, yeah, sure, okay. If h is 10 to 14 GV, then yes, psi has to be smaller than, don't remember, 3, 4, 5, whatever. If, if you want inflation to happen at the TV scale, psi has to be smaller than about 23. But there will also be a source of analogous energy from, from the, from the time, time dependence of the magnetic field of super horizon scale, right? Yes, but I don't think that that's going to be a problem because this is still blue enough. So you're saying because your n is less than, uh, yeah. sorry, well, larger than minus 2, you're exactly. saying that it will not grow? Yeah. Well, in other words, uh, let me give you final, well, the final numbers is that we will have even a hard time getting 10 to minus 17 gaps mm -hmm. at Cobby scales. Right. And, you know, typical scale problems, you know, come from fields that are 10 to minus 10 gauss at Cobb scales. No, it's probably true because your n is larger than minus 2 that, you know, well, that you, well so your, your field is basically decaying on super rise yeah. scales, right? Yeah. So that will give a suppression of the... Of exactly. The exactly. So basically all the bad things happen at horizon crossing. Right, right. Okay, primordial gravitational waves. One slide to tell you what are primordial gravitational waves, in case you don't know. They are transverse traceless perturbations of the metric, and they decompose them into left-handed and right-handed gravitons. Okay, two helicity modes plus two minus two helicity. Um, 
what's the equation that controls the production of gravitational waves? It's the usual Klein Gordon equation on uh, on um, on a expanding background with a source. There's electromagnetic field around. And so what I have, I put a projector PIJ lambda on helicity lambda components because I'm looking at the equation of motion for helicity lambda, gravitational waves, on the stress energy tensor, the spatial components of the stress energy tensor of the photon. I will call this thing T lambda, this whole thing, okay? This is the helicity lambda component of the stress energy tensor, if you want. And it's the source. So since I know the right hand side because I have computed the vector field before, and I know how T lambda is related to the vector field, I can compute H with the retarded propagator. This is all well-known stuff. H is going to be the retarded propagator applied to T lambda, so the two-point two function of H is going to be the square of the retarded propagation, the two-point function of the source. Fine. Uh, but remember that there's also the homogeneous solution to the equation, okay? And the homogeneous solution to the equation is just the standard thing. In inflation, we expect to produce gravitational waves. Why? Because I'm quantizing, even in the absence of matter, I'm quantizing a tensor on the top of a time-dependent background. When I go to the canonically normalized field, I get a source term here that looks like a tachyonic term that generates an amplification. And then if I put the right conditions, I get the standard amplification of gravitational waves during inflation that gives me the well-known amplitude h square over m Planck square for the gravitational waves. This is uncorrelated to the other one. So if I denote the power spectrum this way, this is all very pedagogical, I get this final result, where I have two terms. This part here is the standard part. This part here is not. This is what I would get in standard models of inflation. Gravitational waste proportional to h squared. This is what biceps claims to have seen. And if this is true, and this is the end of the story, this gives a measure of h during inflation. But in our case, there is a power proportional to e to the 4 pi psi that is proportional to 4 powers of the photo. Remember, the photo was proportional to e to the pi psi. But times some number. Times, notice, this f plus minus, these two functions are different depending on whether I'm looking at the positive or negative elicity component of the graviton. And this comes from the fact that I'm starting with the helical photons, and so this is going to generate helical gravitons. This function f plus is much larger than a minus. You know, you see that you compute it's like factor of 1,000 to 10,000 larger. I didn't even compute yet the f minus. The f plus as this function uh, as a function of n. You don't really care about the numbers here. Okay. The main thing is that this is the index n. And this is 1.95, and it turns out that actually this function diverges as n goes to 2. As it should, because n goes to 2 means scale invariant electric field. Scale invariant electric field generates a magnetic field, uh, sorry, generates gravitational waves that are logarithmically divergent in the infrared cutoff. So, but then you will have uh, an opportunity in large right? because you have, uh, uh, well, if you have a scalar invariant electric field, you contribute to the energy density as well. And then we'll yeah, so the it's, it's density perturbations in large scales. It's it's just below scaling variant. Then I think you have to sit down and compute. Right, right. Uh, because it's still infrared convergent, and then one has to, to look at numbers. Right. My feeling is that you know I'm stopping here at 1.95. Yeah. I, I think, you know, so, one point, it's 0 0.05 times e to the minus 60, I okay. think it's still going to give a sufficient suppression, but I might be wrong. I, uh, that, that is still part that is right. worth right. looking at, right. and, uh, you know, this is, again, why we are not still out with okay. But this is just to show you that, you know, we did some calculation, there are some numbers. Mm -hmm. So we have this function, and this means that we have this expression for this guy, okay? And this has to be matched to bicep. By the way, as I said, parity gravitational waves, since the left-handed and right-handed photon have different amplitudes, I get different amplitudes for the gravitons. I can understand this physically. When I have two left-handed photons, if they are hitting head-on and produce one graviton, I can get gravitons of both elicities. Well, not really head-on. They, they must have some relative angular momentum, of course. But if I have them 
fusing with very little transverse momentum, it turns out that one elicit of the graviton is only one elicit of the graviton is effectively produced. And this means that if I have two left-handed photons, then by elicity conservation, I'm going to produce a left-handed graviton in this kind of process. This is why I get much more uh, much more left-handed gravitons than right-handed gravitons. Okay. Um, once I impose R equal 2.2 from bicep, the theory is left only with two parameters, n and h. And then what I do? Well, I assume instantaneous rewriting just to make my life simpler. Actually, also to make my life, you know, better, better because <laughs> this is the best case. Well, there is an even better scenario that is, you know, reheating dominated by some stiff fluid. But if I go for the standard case of reheating epoch dominated by matter domination, then things are going to get worse. Um, I assume inverse cascade all the way until recombination. And eventually, I get, so I compute the coherence length from this initial condition that is found from equations, the magnetic field from this equation I showed before, and this is the magnetic field I get, and this is my final result. This is, as a function of n, the reheating temperature needed to get 10 to minus 18, 10 to minus 17, 10 to minus 16 Gauss at megaparsec scale. And you see, we are at the order of, you know, 100 GV to TV scale, roughly. But that is assuming some inverse cascading... Uh, this is assuming inverse cascade all the way to recombination. Right. Um, okay. This is also, you know, not totally final. Mm -hmm. There's very strong dependence of many parameters. You know, if I change the initial coherence length by a factor of 2 or 3, this curve is going to go down by half an order, you know, by an order of magnitude again. But, you know... To, as we were saying, you know, this morning, no, we are still, you know, error bars that are still two orders of magnitude. So this is, this is... No, because I'm thinking of this conservative uh, of a bound where you just assume that you have no bag reaction and no strong coupling, but there you don't have, you don't assume any inverse cascading. So, yes. So that bound here is probably violating that, like, conservative of a bound, but that's because you are assuming no inverse, and you, you don't make any... You don't assume any inverse cascading for that bound probably. Yes. Right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there, there's two things that are actually going in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. In one direction, inverse cascade is helping me. Mm -hmm. In the other direction, I'm using a much stricter bound, that is this bound from the gravitational waves. Right. This bound tells you, and th th again, this is, as I told you before, it's surprising because on the basis of dimensional analysis, I would say that this tells me that the energy in the magnetic field should be 10 to minus 5 of the background energy. It turns out from this numerical calculation, it has to be 10 to minus 10. I might be wrong somewhere. But this is 10 orders of magnitude stronger than the standard bound that is just, let's assume that the energy is less than the background energy. Um, and it turns out that these two effects go in opposite direction, but luckily they seem to go at least eventually things go a little bit better because, you know, TV scale inflation is not great, but it's not ruled out. If you assume this mechanism for the production of gravitational waves. Right. Uh, so, how much is the enhancement due to the inverse cascade? I mean, oh, he doesn't like, get enhancement, but he. he, no, he I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean he, he loses some power, right? But I lose some hand, power in the intensity of the field, hand, but I gain in the coherence length. He, he, he needs to produce it on shoulder scale, right? <coughs> yes. So it's easier to produce things on shoulder scale because you get less dilution throughout the inflation. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, he, he pays the price that the inverse cascading also takes some of his uh, amplitude. Yeah. Well, you, you know, the, the main thing is that my coherence length scales gains a factor of <coughs> one electron volt. Sorry. A, a factor of reheating temperature over one electron volt to the two thirds. So if reheating is TV, mm -hmm. TV divided by one electron volt is 10 to 12, to the two thirds is 10 to 8. I get a gain a factor of 10 to 8 in coherence length. So, so say, I mean, now, I mean, in the rattle model that we looked at, of course, you cannot use inverse cascading because they are not helical yeah, fields. Yeah, exactly. But if you could produce the, the magnetic fields on a scale like 10 to the 8, whatever you said, the yeah. shorter, of course, you could get much larger magnetic fields, right? Because the problem is to maintain the magnetic fields throughout inflation. Exactly. Exactly. That's why I also 
you know, we start the, the production as late as possible. Yeah, exactly. So, but I mean, it's an interesting point also that, I mean, you know, even if you are like in some excited state, mm -hmm. so you could imagine like, you know, some general helical, you know, initial oh, yeah. state, and then just use this other mechanism to gain something from the inverse cascading. Uh, well, so there is one point that I, I, I'm not doing here because I'm starting, I'm putting this by, by you know, maximal elicit. It's not really maximal. But oh, you need to graduate. Uh, in order but to but for this, this thing, because of this inverse cascade, it has had that this helicity is a sort of an attractor. You know, you start with a field, uh, with a magnetic field that has a very small elicity. Mm -hmm. If you wait for long enough, it will always have maximal elicity because the non helical part dilutes away, the helical part stays. No, but you also need the boost of the helical, I mean, to yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, then the starting with maximal elicity is just telling me that I, I'm getting the maximal benefit. I'm starting mm -hmm. this as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so can you test, uh, I mean, how does one test if the gravity waves are helical? Uh, I have a talk for that. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, well, I can tell you now. The yeah, main I don't thing, know if the other guys are stationed. I don't Do know if they, Well, I'm already going over time. Uh, yeah. I don't know how, how much time I'm allowed. Then yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have two slides. I have two, two slides. Two okay, slides. let's do the two slides and then we can... Uh, well, actually, I think one slide because one is this one. Uh, so these are the comments. First of all, should be seen as an order of magnitude destiny. Second, these are upper bounds for, I assume that R, I want R to be equal to 0.2. Tomorrow it turns out that bicep is wrong, and actually we have some super great experiment that tells us that R has to be smaller than 10 to minus 6. Well, all I have to do is take these upper bounds, these results I had before, convert them into upper bounds, and scale them by this factor. R over 0.2 to the 1 quarter. So it's not a very strong dependence, okay? The magnetic fields would be helical. There is some, well... But in that case, you don't need the helical story, right? Yes. <laughs> yes, also. That's also true. Anyway. Um, the magnetic fields... Um, no, it's not that I don't need it. It's that I don't want it in that case. That's why this becomes an upper bound. Oh, you don't want to generate too much... Yeah, I don't want to generate too much gravitational waves. This magnetic field should be helical, would be helical, and there are conjectures in the literature about the fact that you might, in principle, measure the primordial elicity, and this is a very long shot, but never mind, people talked about it. Uh, this is what I was saying before, since these magnetic fields are in any case so weak, because of the blue index, I don't expect, in principle, to have any other effects on the CMB than those that are produced at horizon crossing. This is about chiral gravitational waves. This is the main possible observable. In the CMB, we look at polarization. And polarization is divided in two modes, the so-called E modes that are parity even, and the B modes that are now so popular that are parity odd. In a parity invariant CMB, the correlator temperature fluctuations that is parity even and B modes that is parity odd better be zero because this would violate parity. On the other hand, if your gravity waves are chiral, the first signature where you expect this to be seen is this one. Unfortunately, it's difficult to measure this. Um, in particular, if you take, for instance, the bicep paper, but, you know, uh, was the same on Planck, they actually impose this on their data to correct for some possible uh, misalignment of their, their, uh, their apparatus. So for them, this is actually an assumption. So there, was, there were a couple of papers, well, there were older papers, one by Kanyukovsky that was studying the prospects of detection of this. There is a more recent paper by people in Orsay, very recent, like one month ago. And basically, their statement is, forget it about, about measuring this on ground-based experiments, but if you add something like bicep in the sky, or even, you know, whatever, an, an improved plank or something, then you might be able, if gravitational waves are really large, like 0.2, then you might be able to detect this as, you know, five sigma significance. Uh, even more ambitious, this is one discussion, this a paper that I like to advertise with Jessica Cook, who was a student in Amherst back then. Uh, we would have the tensor perturbations that are non-Gaussian, while the scalar perturbations are essentially Gaussian. And this is because this mechanism produces preferentially tensors as opposed to scalars because of elicity conservation. 
Uh, this slide I don't need to discuss because this is what I just said before, how, where this model comes from. And this is the conclusions. Uh, I would say that I presented a not so simple model that is at least consistent with observations. And this is work in progress. Uh, can this at least be one more existence proof? Well, and I think this is really my conclusion. 